Happy Friday, friends. Matt with Eddie's Guitars coming to you, as always, from St. Louis, Missouri. We appreciate you joining us on another Friday, taking a look at some of our recent arrival acoustic guitars that we've gotten in the shop recently here. Uh, we are starting things off on a strong note. As you can see, we've got a beautiful OMS on my lap from my buddy, Mr. Dana Bourgeois. This happens to be a Victorian style OMS guitar with uh, with some pretty cool wood upgrades that we've been able to do to it. So the Victorian style uh, guitars that Bourgeois makes uh, is kind of um, uh, lightly uh, a reference to the woods used, um, more seriously a reference to sort of the aesthetic package of the guitar. Uh, and Hondro, if you wouldn't mind switching that camera angle for me, we will take a look at the uh, details that I'm referring to. You can see that the uh, the purfling around the top of the guitar is that beautiful kind of colorful rope purfling as well as the matching rosette there. Very beautiful stuff and not your, you know, the world's most traditional looking stuff either, which I really like. Let's see if we can get up close on that purfling there. Really nice detail and color in there, like I said, with that matching rosette as well. You can see that top as well is just an exquisite age tone Italian spruce top. Very, very tight grain with that great golden color to it. This is a particularly consistent and beautiful looking top, if you ask me. The back and sides of this guitar are an incredible set of Cuban fiddleback mahogany. Uh, this is the natural color of the, uh, the Cuban mahogany. This doesn't have any stain or colorants on it whatsoever. This is just clear finish over the natural wood. You can see how figured it is, and uh, again, just the beautiful color. Cuban mahogany tends to be just slightly more dense than its cousin Honduran mahogany, so you get a little bit glassier of a sound. It tends to have a little bit longer sustain qualities as well, which I really like out of mahogany. And I think that particularly nicely pairs with the uh, age-tone Italian spruce on the top of the guitar. You can see a very clean headstock veneer there with that bourgeois logo all the way up the, the top of the uh, slotted headstock there. And the uh, fully engraved uh, tuning machines with the uh, ebony buttons on there, tying in with the ebony bridge and fingerboard. Really just a beautiful and powerful guitar. The, uh, like I said, the combination of the Italian spruce and the uh, that figured Cuban mahogany just makes for a powerful and punchy sound. But again, that, that slightly higher uh, hardness of that mahogany, I think, really holds on to that sustain nicely, too. It gives you some nice bloom out of it. Folks, as always, uh, joining me behind the controls here is Mr. Hondro. Say hello to everyone. And What's up, guys? How's it going? Say hello to Hondro. Please let us know if you are having trouble hearing anything, because I do not know what I'm doing. So. Oh, great. So does that mean we're having technical difficulties? No. As always, folks... We, uh, we would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions about anything that we're playing or honestly anything even that we're not playing today, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. Very, very strong start though with this, with this beauty. We've got just some incredible guitars to play through today that I am pretty excited about. This is another one that just came in within the last week and a half or so. From Mr. Marchione. This is, uh, this is a Marchione OMC. Uh, this is don't believe that there's ever been a an, an OMC uh, that Stevens built quite like this guitar. Um, this has some really cool woods on it too, which we'll get into, but I definitely want to play it a bit. I've just been, the, uh, the uh, amount that I've had to play this guitar since it's been in the shop, I've just noticed that the, um, as with the acoustics that I've been able to play of from Mr. Marchione so far, just absolutely incredible playability and seriously incredible intonation. Uh, accuracy on these guitars, which uh, 
makes the player's life a lot easier when they're not having to fiddle with tuning back and forth all the time. So. sustain there for sure very pure can we take a look at the back of that guitar oh we're getting there are we we are getting there <laughs> gladly cover the uh, the woods on this beautiful guitar we'll take a look at this top first we have a beautiful swiss spruce top very very beautiful looking specimen here with just a bit of uh, asymmetrical uh, just little flecks of bear claw in there and i'll tell you what the more i see tops like this with just a bit of character in them the more i really really love them don't have to be totally perfectly you know mirror match on each side in terms of some of that bear claw to have some really incredible natural beauty out of these you can see the uh the binding on this guitar is a highly highly figured extra curly silver maple on there the back and sides of this guitar i gotta be honest with you this is a new uh species for me this is west african ebony uh no it is not macassar ebony um, it is West African ebony. This is, um, and I'm going to forget the name. I, I know I should have looked at my notes before we uh, got this far, Hondra. Um, there, there's a, a gentleman's wood collection that uh, Stephen Marchione was able to get his hands on and, and kind of pick through a little bit. And I'm, I'm going to totally space on that luthier builder's name. Um, but this, uh, this ebony came from that stash of wood, and you can just see how dead straight it is. And I'm sorry, it's practically a mirror because it's so dark and has that nice high polish on it. But um, it is very perfectly quarter sawn, super dead straight wood. Take my word for it if you can't see it on your screen there. The neck of this guitar is pretty sharp, too. It actually matches the binding material on the body of the guitar, which, again, is that super curly silver maple. Very, very cool. Very cool indeed. Just a sharp, almost kind of tuxedo kind of looking guitar with the blondes and the darks on there. Uh, let us not neglect this unbelievably powerful headstock as well. Just unbelievable headstock, especially with that maple on the back poking through. Very cool stuff. Those are uh, kind of modern style Spurzel locking tuning machines on there as well. Nice touch for sure. And as I said, this thing just plays uh, like a Lamborghini, man. It is uh, perfectly set up, um, holds the tuning, has great tuning stability. And as I said, just all the way up the neck, it really uh, just has very sweet intonation. and nuance in there.
very fun guitar there, man. Very glad to have the uh, the Marchione guitars under our roof here. Just exquisite work in these guitars. Awesome stuff. We had a question from Jay Domingo. Certainly. He's curious if Bear Claw affects the tone, or is it just for aesthetic? You know, it's a natural occurrence that you will find in uh, certainly not just spruce, um, but it's it's kind of most recognizable to us in the spruces for sure. Um, and generally, no, I don't believe it affects tone. In a really extreme case, in certain examples, um, there is truth to that there can be more stiffness present in a highly bear clawed piece of wood compared to a non bear clawed piece of wood, but that's not a hard and fast rule by any means at all. That's a, uh, you know, you got to judge each piece by its own kind of criteria and personality. It's not, uh, not specifically the case at all. No, good question though. to the next guitar folks we have a super super fun little iris guitar as really most of them all are it's, it's honestly been a while since we've had an iris og um, in our store here this is a, a super cool one here uh, we will um, we'll, we'll take a look at the woods in just a second let's take a quick listen on roll and man that's cool stuff so again this is the iris og and i uh, think you know kind of gibson uh lg1 kind of vibes or lg in general just in terms of the size and shape of this guitar it's kind of that medium body medium thickness let's take a look at this top here hondra of course you can see we've got that classic sunbursted kind of tobacco sunburst top there this happens to be an Adirondack spruce top on this example here, and I think that you can certainly hear that drive uh, that that Adirondack brings to the sound of this guitar. Definitely has a, a bit of extra, almost overdrive to the sound when you let it, uh, you know, kind of compress and, uh, you know, kind of get, get crunchy there a little bit. Very, very cool sound. Uh, very nice use of, you know, just an, a good Addy top in this style of guitar. You can see that tiger stripe pick guard as well, which I really like the look of on a, on a sunburst, but I'll be honest with you, I like a tiger stripe pick guard on natural black sunburst, anything, I don't care. Very clean, straight grain Honduran mahogany on the back and sides of this guitar. You can see just great looking set of uh, plain Jane mahogany, and I'm not going to complain about that at all. Very nice looking straight stuff here. Looks like very stable, long lasting wood if you ask me. Of course, all the way up top there, we have the unbound iris headstock with the uh, very bold stenciled on gold logo there. Of course, we have the ivory binding on the neck and the body of the guitar. Very, very kind of classically styled again. Let's put this in. Uh, what are we going to do here?
good bark to the sound of this guitar. And you, you can hear it's a fresh guitar with a with a with a new Addy top on it. I think with a bit of uh, mileage on this guitar, this will fatten up and warm up a little bit. One other thing I have yet to mention, and, and will not neglect to do so, um, the neck carve on this guitar is a bit different than the standard. Normally this would have a little bit more substantial feeling neck, more of kind of a vintage feel. This particular guitar does have a slimmer C profile on it. Basically they just call it their thinner neck. It's a, what I would call kind of a classic uh, not particularly modern, not particularly old school, just right down the middle, C-shaped neck to this guitar, inch and three-quarter at the nut, super comfortable, no complaints whatsoever, and I think generally fits just the style of the guitar as well in terms of the feels. indeed what I really like about those iris guitars is how lightweight they feel like in your hands I, and I how they I almost said that before I it, the, continued to put it on the wall but I say it every single time I pick one of their guitars up or talk about one is how light they are so I wasn't going to repeat myself but yeah. you're I mean it's astounding like how it <laughs> how well it projects and it sounds nice and full with I know just being there's, such there's a lightweight holding it back guitar or... you know just got a quick question for you yeah. Matt from Guitar Head, um, do you think the finger style application is more friendly on the OM body shape or the shape of a modified dreadnought like the Samaji Costal or Buendia? Which I'm not Buendia, familiar. Leo Buendia. Buendia. Um, very, very good question. It, it, that, that is entirely, entirely up to you. How do you play the guitar? Myself personally, uh, for many, 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 many months, years, whatever you want to call it, I was a die-hard OM guy and continue to be in a lot of ways. Um, the, more, uh, the more I explore my playing and my style, the more I'm realizing I do appreciate maybe a little bit more body in some cases. Um, it's hard to complain about a Dana Bourgeois OM or a Santa Cruz OM or a Marchione or go on down the list, but uh, playing some of the guitars that I've had the opportunity to play, having a little bit more body like a modified D or other contexts of a little bit larger guitar than an OM uh, can be really nice for dynamic qualities, for a little bit extra rumble in the bass, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no right answer. It depends on what you are as a player, who you are as a player, and what you want to hear out of it. So... Um, Easy solution is get one of each or, you know, multiples of each is the, uh, the simple answer there. If only it were so simple. Or you could just buy a Coca Bolo OM by, uh, by Dana and never have to question it ever again. <laughs> Speaking of which, we will, uh, before I get carried away with this one, which I know is about to happen, let's take a quick look at some of these woods. What this is, it's a 14 fret standard scale length OM from Bourgeois. This is an OM DB Signature Deluxe model. This has a beautiful, striking redwood top. Nice, beautiful, warm color to it. A downright crazy set of Cocobolo on the back and sides. Just incredible figure to this. Really particularly beautiful set of Cocobolo. Great color. 
I love just the extreme contrast from those those real deep darks to the lighter kind of streaks, and they're just a lot of range of color and tonality, and they're just beautiful. All bound in super, super curly koa, as, uh, as we tend to do on a lot of these DB Signature and Deluxe guitars. And of course, you can see that, that intricate, colorful three-tone, if I can get it in the frame there, three-tone herringbone around the top of the guitar. A very handsome uh, wood rosette there going around the sound hole. This guitar has a beautiful matching Cocobolo headstock veneer, Mother of Pearl logo all the way up top there, and those are the diamond and arrow, uh, I'm sorry, not fingerboard rather, but headstock inlay on there. Beautiful, beautiful, just all the, all the little parts on this. Uh, also a pyramid bridge on this guitar rather than the standard belly bridge. Uh, we have the standard one and three quarter nut with a standard nice two and five sixteenth spacing down there at the bridge. One of my, physically speaking, one of my absolute favorite setups as far as uh, acoustic guitars go. That is a very good one.
vibrant sound and yeah. super resonant. Yeah. There's a couple of calls for you to play that uh, with fingertips for a ah, second. Ooh, yes. Without Gladly. the pick. And then we got a couple of questions for you after that. out of that thing yeah that's awesome really nice man a couple of questions for you uh, can we take another look at that back real quick oh yeah 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 absolutely Thanks. try to get some good light on it there for you if we can it is ridiculously spider webby if you can get up kind of close on her there really wild stuff Let's look at that butt end too while we're here, right? <laughs> Super curly koa, little tail wedge down there. Beautiful book matching on all that wood, man. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Very, very glassy sound. Yeah. Um, Redwood and cocoa. We had a question from uh, one of the newer players in the chat was curious um, maybe a couple of tips on what you would suggest to sort of get to where you're at to be comfortable playing finger style. Ooh. You know, I guess I, I kind of mentioned that you were into math rock a lot. Um, yeah. Coming up a little bit. For and I, sure. I feel like that comes through without being directly reflected all the time. But. Um, oh, boy. I'll tell you, uh, a lot of the folks that I listen to today, I'm going to just give you one name, and I'll guarantee you if you don't already know who this guy is, he will, just listening to him, much less trying to play or utilize any of the techniques he's using, just listening to him will keep you plenty busy for a long time. Trevor Gordon Hall, go look him up immediately uh, if you're trying to get into. Um, he, the thing I like about Trevor is he goes from very mellow, very sweet, unbelievably intimate playing to insane acrobatics, but with class. <laughs> Sometimes um, a lot of, you know, beating the heck out of the guitar and, you know, doing stuff for showmanship is, uh, is definitely cool. And I envy a lot of the ability to do that. But musically if you're just going to sit down and listen to a recorded version of it without watching it being performed i want it to captivate me just as much and uh, trevor's music is that music to me at least so um techniques and stuff just look him up on youtube and just look at what he's doing because he will um if, if you even remotely like what i'm doing you'll love what he's doing <laughs> so we uh Many of us look up to Trevor. Uh, he is a, an inspiration for sure. So, and then uh, can you give a just a real quick rundown of a couple of differences between Coco Bolo and Madagascar? And do you have a preference? Uh, so, Coco Bolo generally is found in Central America, Mexico, where Madagascar rosewood obviously is found in Madagascar. So that's you know just geologically a pretty big difference there, a difference at the very least. Um, Coco Bolo tends to be a heavier, denser wood. Uh, depending on how it's cut, it can be less stable, potentially. Uh, but 
all wood can be unstable, you know, if you'll let it be unstable. Uh, but coca bolo tends to be a harder, heavier wood, so you tend to get more drama out of the um, the glassiness of the guitar, the, the rich lows, the sparkling highs. In my experience, you tend to get less of the stuff in between, the woodiness, the presence of mid-range. Um, Madagascar rosewood very much so has, honestly, a lot of all of those qualities, richness, beautiful singing highs, but it still has that woody mid-range that uh, gives it a more classic Brazilian-like type of sound to a lot of people's ears. Uh, doesn't tend to be quite as physically heavy to pick up a Madagascar rosewood guitar. For example, we're going to play a, a froggy bottom here in just a moment that's Madagascar rosewood. If I didn't know what it was and didn't listen to the guitar, I would swear it's a mahogany or something lighter weight. Uh, but it's a very light guitar, as opposed to the bourgeois that we just set down. It's not an incredibly heavy guitar, but when you pick it up, you can feel the coca bolo does add a little bit more weight just to the feel of it. Uh, so just something to be aware of if you're hypersensitive to the weight of a guitar. Cool. And folks, we have rapidly moved on to an incredibly special guitar. My friend Michael Bashkin. This is an OMC, and boy, oh boy, if a, a perfect sounding guitar exists, I think this might be a uh, a close relative to it. <laughs> um, once again, we're going to take a look at what this thing actually is before we we dive super deep. We have an incredible Italian, uh, excuse me, Italian spruce top on this guitar. You can see how blonde it is, all the incredible medullary ray or silking, as it's otherwise uh, kind of called commonly, uh, in the top of this guitar. Just beautiful stuff, and I love the silhouette and just overall shape of, uh, of Michael's OMC guitars. Just beautiful looking guitar. Nice petite little bridge there with just a bit of carving and stylization in there, really nice. Back and sides of this guitar are a set of koa that, uh, that Michael Bashkin basically said, don't get comfortable with this because I don't have any more koa like this and I'm not sure I'll be coming into any more anytime soon. This is incredible, old, old, incredible koa. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. You can see the, the natural golden color to it, of course, under that beautiful finish. And man, oh man, is that just spectacularly finished wood. He was very excited about this. And uh, Michael's dealt with a lot of wood in his day. So, uh, of course, I am also going to be very excited about it. We also have one of his signature headstocks on this guitar with uh, with rosewood, as well as some nice uh, spalted kind of bird's eye maple in there. Just Absolutely incredible details. Very tasteful with a very effortless feel still. I don't know. I don't know how he does that. But Great headstock. It. Great headstock. Man, I'll tell you. <laughs> got a, a few wonderful headstocks on the wall today. This is this is one of them for sure. And when we were talking about uh, the weight of guitars, I would be remiss if I did not comment on the insane lightweight of this guitar. I'm telling you. It's filled with something that is lighter than oxygen because this thing is floating. Uh, it is so freaking light. Uh, still does not have a, you know, super fragile feel to it, though. It feels like this is a guitar you could get, you know, dig into a bit and, and have it, have it, you know, move right along with you. So pretty, pretty fun. But, uh, yeah, we've... Um, I, I've worn the strings out on this one a couple of times already since it's been in the shop. So.
uh, I realized that this is a quality that's not going to translate over iPhones and Androids and computer screens and speakers and such, but just the resonance of the back of this guitar and the bass that you can feel out of it is very unique. Let me just put it that way. Not, not something I experience often, especially in a brand freaking new guitar. And, and this just, you can just feel almost everything that you're hearing. It seems like it's a very immersive experience. <laughs> fine stuff there. Which strings did you put on that? Santa Cruz Low Tension Parabolics. Nice. Which um, it's worth uh, worth saying this is not what Michael strings the guitar with uh, before it got to us and I'm totally spacing on what he actually uses. I want to say I want to say Pierce but I know I'm wrong. So I won't say anything at all. Probably GHS boomers. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a question. Um, how does Koa compare in sound and warmth to Honduran mahogany? Oh, good question. Honduran mahogany tends to be a warmer and drier sounding wood. Uh, I think that we adequately heard the overtones and just air presence in this guitar. At least I hope these microphones uh, translated some of that adequately. Um, mahogany tends to have a lot less of that. Mahogany is really tends to be a, Honduran mahogany at least tends to be a strong fundamental wood, but it usually doesn't have tons and tons of overtones on its own. If you pair it with an Italian spruce or Swiss spruce top, you can get some that way, but if you're using an Adirondack, Sidka spruce top, that tends to be a fairly dry sound where even if you were to pair this koa with uh, something other than Italian spruce, say Adirondack or, um, or Sidka spruce, you would still have, I think, a more overtone present sound, a slightly brighter sound in the koa because it's just a more reflective wood in that regard. So um, all beautiful flavors in, uh, in, in nature's ice cream bucket <laughs> <laughs> yeah i say that all the time um i mean do you think it's true that um to some degree that koa i've heard i've heard people say that koa takes time to open up that you need to play koa that it doesn't that always sound so big when you build it but that it may i i think that years. that is completely true of all woods. Just, that's just everything and to not varying just degrees yeah. sure to varying degrees by species sure to varying degrees by individual piece of pieces of wood, that's the right answer. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> cool. um, I've I've heard that too. You know, same same thing with Adirondack. Everybody says yeah. Adirondack takes so long to play in and break in, and in some cases that's true. But man, I'll tell you what, I've played enough Santa Cruz guitars and Preston Thompson guitars that are a month old that sound drastically different than you know when they were, you know. A week old, you know, so they, they do change pretty rapidly, especially when they're young guitars like what we tend to have around here. So. Yeah. A 
always an exciting time when we have a fresh froggy bottom in the shop here. And man, I'll tell you what, this one's been turning my head every time I hear somebody in the other room strumming on it or picking on it a little bit. This one has definitely gotten my attention. This is a beautiful, super, super comfortable little froggy bottom Model M Deluxe. Um, if you're familiar with the classic Model K from Froggy Bottom, this is a very similar guitar, just shrunk down a little bit. This is roughly the same size as an OM, but you'll see it's a curvier body than an OM. has a little bit more of a Gibson type of a feel in its tight waist and a little bit smaller upper bout. The top that you can see there is a beautiful red spruce top, otherwise known as Adirondack Spruce. Uh, just a beautiful specimen here. It seems to be extra blonde for some reason, but I don't mind that a bit. The Model M would typically come with a belly-shaped bridge, and it's worth mentioning this has a uh, the pyramid bridge there. Very nice. I just think that's a nice kind of classic-looking touch, especially uh, foregoing the pickguard on the guitar. It just gives it a nice kind of contemporary and clean look on this guitar especially with that nice kind of darker figured binding as well, which is a nicely figured koa binding there. Nice dark rich color on that on that koa. Like I said, very, very highly figured with a lot of three-dimensional, uh, you know, figuring throughout the entire way around there. Back and sides of this guitar, um, not going to make any mystery about it. This is some of my favorite wood out there that is being used for guitars right now. This is 5A Madagascar Rosewood from the personal collection of Mr. Michael Millard of Froggy Bottom Guitars. And this is just some of the most exquisite Madagascar Rosewood that I believe is out there. Still available, like I said, on guitars in general. Uh, very cool story behind the acquisition of this wood, which I will not go into the depth of at this moment, but very cool story behind it. Bother me after this if you want to hear about it. It's cool stuff. Michael Millard material, so it's always interesting for sure. Uh, like I said, nice Koa heel cap there on the back of the guitar. Nice bit of figured wood there. Never hurts. And a beautifully matching Madagascar rosewood veneer. On the face of that headstock there and that seems to be like an extra colorful uh, figured piece of abalone or power shell there for the frog on the headstock that's a really really good one yeah that pops sure does sure does and standard uh, neck treatment on this guitar we have the regular one and three quarter neck the standard slim uh, C profile neck from froggy bottom and the standard 20 inch fingerboard radius, which I have really come to love the feel of that very, very friendly neck to play. Nothing getting in your way or, uh, I'll tell you, especially the bar chords with that 20-inch fingerboard radius, if they're just particularly friendly. Uh, the bridge spacing, however, on this guitar is not standard. The standard spacing for this guitar would be 2 and 3 sixteenths. We opted to go just a little bit wider to the 2 and 5 sixteenths spacing at the bridge, which actually is a fairly common thing for folks to order from Froggy Bottom Guitars. Uh, to my surprise, uh, a year or so ago, Michael Millard actually told me, he said, yeah, in the book, 2 and 3 sixteenths is technically standard, but he said, you wouldn't believe we actually build more 2 and 5 sixteenths guitars than we do 2 and 3 sixteenths. So they were considering changing the standard, but then they figured that might get confusing. And everybody that knows knows to order it that way anyway. So, so we do. And uh, again, Adirondack and uh, I'll tell you what, really, really, really beautiful rosewood is, is just a good combination, man.
What do you think, Andrew? I really like it. It sounds really sweet. Yes, yes, to- totally agree. Like a little bit more mellow than some of the other stuff we've been looking at, but not lacking in any response. No, yet. no, and again, it's it, it's cool. It, 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 it makes me a little bit nervous when a guitar... I don't mind that a guitar doesn't have a super, super sparkly top end, but it does make me nervous when it lacks that, and it also lacks a degree of sustain because I feel like you're you're constantly having to feed it more and it's not wanting to just bloom on its own. And guitars like this just have that natural, just want to keep going and going and it just don't, doesn't cut out on you. Um, yeah, that sustain is awesome. It, it, it allows you to play more dramatically, which is more fun. Yeah. <laughs> A good one indeed. Very nice. Froggy Bottom Model M Deluxe with that nice sharp Florentine cutaway on there. Very, very sharp looking guitar, man. Yeah, don't hurt yourself, man. Seriously. <laughs> DC Rich called. They want their points back. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what, we've got some just gems today. Holy cow. Been a busy couple weeks on the in the receiving room there, it seems like. Somebody turned the volume up on this one a little bit.
tremendous depth in that sound. Wow. Before I forget, let's talk about what it is. This is another Dana Bourgeois. This is an OMSC Soloist model. Uh, so this has all sorts of crazy customizations to it. The Soloist model, um, at its core, is not an OMSC, the 12 fret version. The Soloist, at its core, is an OMC, which is a 14 fret guitar. This is a custom variation of a 12 fret version of that Soloist guitar. You can see that the top that we started with is a beautiful sinker redwood top. Man, oh man, is this a glorious specimen here. Holy cow, beautiful, beautiful top. Back and sides of this guitar are a fantastic set of Brazilian rosewood as well. Just a fantastic wood combination, redwood and Brazilian, man oh man especially for finger style and doing some more of the delicate stuff. And you can hear, as I just played with a flat pick, this thing will get up and roar with the best of them, too. No, no question about it. The whole guitar, including the neck and the headstock, is all bound in uh, Brazilian rosewood. You can see the fingerboard there is also Brazilian rosewood. It's a particularly nice, colorful, spiderwebby uh, set there, uh, perfectly matching the bridge as well. Just a beautiful Brazilian rosewood bridge there. We also have the Brazilian rosewood veneer on the face of that slotted headstock. Very, very nice. Of course, the mother of pearl logo all the way up top and the ebony buttons on those engraved Waverly tuning machines. Three on a plate there. Really beautiful stuff. And this again, this is a 25 and a half inch scale length guitar. So standard scale length, we have standard nut width of one and three quarter, standard bridge spacing of uh, two and five sixteenths. Uh, the pyramid bridge is not standard to the OMSC model. However, it is standard to the soloist model. So like I said, we've got kind of a jumble of different specs happening in this guitar here, but most importantly, regardless of what it's called or what series it's a part of, it is just a miraculous sounding guitar. A lot of power and just punch, especially considering the, the redwood. Normally is a little bit more of a timid sounding top. This one really can roar very easily. The, the benefit of going with a slotted headstock over a, a traditional one, and and I'll second that with, I absolutely hate restringing slotted headstocks. Sure. Uh, <laughs> if you hate restringing slotted headstocks, look up. <clears throat> excuse me. Look up um, um, T J Thompson's video on how to restring a slotted headstock. He does a little thing to where he he orients the holes a certain way first mm -hmm. before you know take so, all the strings off. Gotcha. He orients the holes a certain way first, and then he puts a very specific crimp, he like pre crimps yeah. the end of the string, and then it's it's pretty. I don't do it that way because I've done it a different way for so many years. But for folks that aren't doing this daily, uh, it's it's a pretty helpful tip. Yeah. Do you think there's any um, realistic differences in the sound from a slotted headstock? Man, I'll tell you, it's it's so hard. We we could have this exact same guitar made with a with a non-slotted headstock, with a solid headstock, and basically what you would experience there. I'm going to see if I can show it on this camera. Switch that for me, if you would, please. Thank you, sir. As you can see, the angle of those strings, this might not be news to anybody, I just want to visualize it, the angle of those strings physically goes into the headstock, where as a non-slotted headstock, obviously you have the tuning posts that come out and the strings wrap around it. So the break angle across the nut on a slotted headstock guitar will be greater. It's going to have a more extreme angle on this guitar as opposed to a solid headstock. Does that change the sound? Does the physical mass difference, one more time, thank you, Hondra, does the physical mass difference of that wood being cut out make a difference in the sound? Yes, I'm sure all of that stuff has an impact on the finished product of a guitar, but I think that it's probably such a small thing in the picture of the whole guitar, you know, that it's, 
I would probably ignore it one way or another, honestly. I, I, uh, if I were ordering a custom guitar and they said, okay, you're making a 12 fret, do you want a slotted headstock or a solid headstock? Personally, I like the look of a slotted headstock, so that's what I would vote for. You know, some people do have a little bit more trouble restringing these, though, so, you know, it's, it's all. Don't get too hung up on that if you're trying to decide between yeah. One or the other is what I'm getting at. Can you play that one a little finger? Did we do fingerstyle yet? Uh, I, can, a bit? I can plunk out something here if my hands are still wanting to work. sound with the with the bare finger stuff and it uh might be worth mentioning i my my nails are not in even remotely long so you're hearing skin on strings here for better or worse and that's what i mean this is one of those guitars like i like i said doesn't have a ton of super top end brightness but man just the the sustain and resonance that carries the low stuff, the rumbly stuff, is awfully satisfying. That is a sweetie there, man, oh man. <laughs> and folks, we have reached the end of the line, as we tend to do. And as I tend to do, we like to save... Uh, Something kind of special for the last guitar for those of you that stick around here for the duration. We always appreciate that. And um, we have something very, very special here. It's a recent arrival from my good friends at Santa Cruz Guitar Company. After um, a lot of calculation and arithmetic and mathematical calculations, I have uh, deemed it factual that I cannot both afford a new guitar like this and a divorce. So <laughs> this guitar remains available, sadly. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about it super quickly here because, again, I can tell I'm going to, I'm going to make, make Hondro late for everything he's trying to do tonight. I'm not going to go into the full story of this top because we're going to do a full video on this guitar and a few others that we have coming that I'll, I'll fully go into what it is. I'll tell you what it is, though. This is referred to as the Fort Ross Chapel Redwood. Uh, Fort Ross, I'm uh, sorry, the chapel at Fort Ross was built in 1816, and that structure, which is no longer standing, was held up by some impressive redwood beams. Um, yada, 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 it's a guitar now. So, uh, long story short, Richard Hoover, let's go back to this angle here, Richard Hoover uh as he does out there in California, gets word of reclaimed woods. And uh, fortunately, he got word of this reclaimed redwood that came out of this old, old chapel that, like I said, is no longer standing there at Fort Ross. Uh, I, I, I don't even want to try to count the grain lines on this. It is so ridiculously, filthily tight uh, I can't imagine the age of the tree that went into the beams that created this building structure that uh, is now making the soundboard for this incredible guitar. Uh, Hondro, don't go anywhere there. i got to show him the rest of this guitar. I don't know what Whoops. I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Just as impressive, if not more so, are the back and sides of this guitar. 
Uh, this is the first of its kind that we have had in the shop here. I hope you can see it. I hope it's I'm getting it's so dark. Hold on. I know. I know. Let's let's blind everybody. Yeah, blast it. Wow. This is Richard Hoover Select Brazilian Rosewood, and when I say this is the top of the heap, there is no level of heap higher than this right here when it comes to the Brazilian Rosewood at Santa Cruz Guitars. This is literally Richard Hoover's wood, uh, which of course he is technically Santa Cruz, but it is his wood uh, from his personal stash. Uh, it does not get better than this. The grain orientation, just the perfection of this back set uh, cannot be overstated. Um, it's so symmetrical. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's perfect. It is just perfect. We'll look at that headstock before I ask you to switch that camera. But uh, matching beautiful headstock. They were able to harvest just a little bit of sliver there for the face of this headstock as well to keep everything beautifully coordinated. The entire guitar, you will see, is bound in a beautiful red, brick red Cocobolo neck, headstock, everything. And we actually have the Century Block fingerboard inlays also done in Cocobolo. And I wanted to make sure that this was not an ultra loud, super flashy fingerboard. I think just the color is just right. I love that white purfling or the ivory purfling in there, separating the Cocobolo from the rest of the ebony fingerboard with those inlays. Just beautiful work here uh, without being too loud. Got the herringbone border on the top of the guitar as well there. Next to that Coco Bolo binding, just incredibly sharp. Coco Bolo, uh, rosette there around the sound hole, just, just everything is there. Um, forward shifted, fully scalloped, Adirondack spruce braces, all attached with hot hide glue. Inch and three quarter nut, two and a quarter spacing down here at the, um, the uh, Coco Bolo pyramid bridge. And and I tell you, the, the sound is just dripping with insanity. <laughs> one of those guitars that just there's an immersive thing happening here that I, I hope that that our setup is capturing any percentage of it because <laughs> it's a kind of a magical thing happening As I said, folks, we have reached the end of the line, and uh, if you haven't been with us since the beginning and you're with us now, I would just say, once this stops, just go back to the beginning and start it over, because, man, we have just had some insane guitars to play through today. This has been 
one of one of my favorite live streams to date. I've got to say, just based on what I've got behind me, that and because Hondro has had a just done a great job of keeping his mouth closed this time. So. <laughs> I'm kidding, Hondro. <laughs> Well, I guess it's time to pick favorites, right? Um, you're first. Let's have the chat go first. You guys hit us with some of your favorites. Um, because you've teased us with it by leaving it in the room all of the time, people are asking to hear the Orion over there. It's not part of the stream. I'll, but... I'll play it. We weren't going to put it in the stream. It's more of a... So we didn't have the wall, you know, with a bunch of gaps in it. But I mean, hey... Let's do it, man. Twist my arm, why don't you? <laughs> I will. Uh, I will say. The strings are very dead because for the first time ever, I have experimented with a tone right on this guitar for a few days and uh, have not changed the strings on it since the tone right. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, that's that's got some life in it, I think, still. This is a, uh, for those of you who uh, maybe don't know, because uh, I haven't done a proper video on it yet because I'm an idiot, uh, this is a Kevin Ryan Paradiso Grand Concert. We'll just take a super quick look, even though it's probably fingerprinted to <laughs> all get out. This has a Moon Glow Submersion Redwood top on it, or otherwise known as a particularly high-end Sinker Redwood top on this guitar that I am not sad about at all. You can see it's a little bit darker on the edges there where it's kind of lighter in the center, hence the moon glow uh, title that Kevin gave these old, 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 old sinker redwood tops that he has, few left. Uh, all of the guitars that I've seen that he's made with these tops have just been absolute masterpieces and I'm glad to, uh, to have one here. Uh, kind of unique, we've got a Brazilian rosewood bridge on this guitar. Uh, normally, ebony is a more common material to see. do have an ebony fingerboard, though, with the Arts and Crafts rose fingerboard inlay done in Mother of Pearl and Paua Shell and Black Tahitian Pearl, all sorts of beautiful shell types in there. With the Brazilian rosewood uh, headstock veneer, all sorts of beautiful shiny inlay on the headstock there in Powa, including the uh, the Ryan logo with a micro pearl around the R as well. You can see that tiny mother of pearl line around the uh, the actual Powa itself, which is a pretty fine little detail. Godot tuning machines, uh, and hey, what the heck, Brazilian rosewood? Why not? Uh, really awesome set of Brazilian rosewood that the folks at Ryan uh, spoiled me with. Beautiful, beautiful stuff here. Sorry for the fingerprints. Uh, another nice little touch that's kind of rare on Orion is a back strip. We did a uh, power back strip to kind of match the rest of the inlay of this guitar. Thanks for uh, humoring me while I do a little show and tell myself. A guitar that. Um, I will never, if I live a million years, hope to live up to its potential uh, because of how fine it is. But that's that's very true of literally everything that I just played. So, <laughs> um, nice guitar, Hondra. Where are we at? Very with nice. Favorites? Um, the only new favorites are, are that guitar. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but um, the uh, oh man, I forget. I have to scroll back too far, but I feel like some of the bourgeois were winning today. Now, personally, I'm gonna go with the Santa Cruz LM with the, the last uh, one with the Chapel Redwood. Yeah. Hard, Just, hard not to pick that one. Yeah, a combination of you know the the look and the sound, but also the story the behind story. it. Story, man. Yeah, absolutely. So cool. Absolutely. Sometimes I wonder, like, um, what happens to these guitars that we sell to people? Like, I hope they get played and are loved oh. and, like, yes. you know, get passed around Cherished. for 100 years. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, and that's the cool thing. That's what I love about Santa Cruz and Bourgeois. And, again, I, I think everybody on the wall behind me represents this. You can trust folks like that with this precious material. Yeah. And if you yourself keep it responsibly, man, these things will outlast all of us by – I mean, look, look at look at the Martins that still exist. Right. Look at the violins that still exist. You know, this stuff can have longevity. You just got to take care of it, and this stuff needs to be taken care of. They're mm -hmm. they're sweet babies. <laughs> <laughs> um, myself personally, I know we got to go. Man, that Bashkin, I got to tell you, I, I don't I don't know that it's my. I probably is my favorite on the wall behind us. I, was, I didn't want to admit that so easily, but that thing is awesome. Smoking. Um, anything else for me? No. Folks, thank you so so much as always for joining us. We really appreciate you uh, listening to some of these wonderful uh, guitars with us here. Of course, as always, if we can answer any questions that have not already been answered in this live stream, reach out to any of us that work here. Uh, if it's acoustic specific, I'd love to help you. Uh, you can find my email address and phone number on our website and these, you, you know, these videos and everything. So reach out anytime. Um, thanks again, everybody. We'll, uh, we'll see you soon. I hope have a great week.